Good morning, everybody. I'm Brian Lamby, and welcome to, I think, what is uh, the episode eight of our COVID communicators call. This is a call for communications managers and, and others who are interested from across Canada, mostly from Ontario. Um, by all means, uh, let us know who you are in the uh, chat box. I'll just give you a quick orientation before I introduce the, the panel. Um, you can provide questions in the Q&A section. You can also provide questions under the chat feature. We take the view that uh, often the best information is in the audience. So if someone asks a question and you've got an answer to it, please respond uh, and share information. You can share links in the chat box. That's been really helpful. One thing to keep in mind is uh, you're probably defaulting to communicating with the panel. So you want to make sure that you're selecting, uh, you know, sending a message to the panel and all attendees when you're doing that. So feel free to say hello. Tell us where you're coming from because uh, it's good to know there's some people out there. It'd be good to know there's anyone out there given that the weather has improved greatly. Uh, and, and we know that people are, are taking vacations now that things have slowed down a bit. Let me uh, introduce you to the panel. And, and just one last call on that is just do not be shy on asking questions. What we find is people often hang back until the 15 minute mark. You might as well come right out of the gate with your questions. Do not be shy. Uh, might as well make full use of the time we've got. So uh, joining us on the panel, I'm gonna start uh, with the old favorites, uh, Patrick Casey from York Region, uh, Sherry Davidson, from Fort the Lakes, Tony uh, Ivoroni from uh, City of Waterloo, Dana Van Allen uh, from the town, town of Saugeen Shores. And for the first time on the panel, we've got Gary Williams from uh, Durham Region, so welcome. Uh, so good mix of large and small. Uh, feel free to, uh, to ask uh, questions of any of them. Um, I'm gonna kick it off with the first question we, we, we received, which is around economic development. And I will say that this panel is as mostly communications managers as opposed to economic development managers, but my sense is there are economic development managers in the audience. So if any of you have links or resources or things that you would share on this topic, uh, please uh, uh, share that um, in the chat feature. The, uh, the province is opening up regionally, so some of those plans are getting pulled into action. And maybe we'll start by going around the table on who's doing what, particularly uh, in the regions versus uh, Waterloo and cottage country, which I uh, hate to do that to you, Dana and Cherry, but I think the seasonal element that you've got is going to be important for a lot of people. So let's start in, uh, let's start, actually, let's start in cottage country. What are you doing to make sure that you're uh, uh, making as much money as possible in the limited time you have available while keeping people out of town? <laughs> Sherry, you want to begin there? Sure, sure. I have to say, though, uh, if you call us cottage country, there'll be 75,000 <laughs> angry full-time residents that say we are not cottage country. Yeah. Um, but yes, uh, Fourth of Lakes has 250 lakes and rivers. And in the summertime, we have, I would say, you know, upwards of every year, over a million tourists coming into the Fourth of Lakes area. So we're known for that. But through this pandemic, we've really been keeping front and center our full-time residents as well and balancing the needs of seasonal and full-time residents. So um, that aside, our economic development task force is off and running. They've had their first meeting and their next meeting is bringing forward a great big laundry list of ways that we feel we can support our local uh, economic community for everything from uh, opening up patios, you know, wide open into the streets, possibly closing the streets, waiving fees. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of creative ideas coming forward and I think um, council has an appetite to really do everything we can to bolster this very short window over the summer and fall while we have so many visitors coming through while still allowing businesses to be safe and keep themselves and their staff safe. So if this last weekend was any indication, uh, it was our first weekend of stage two. And uh, we had a very successful weekend. Weather was awesome. So patios were open. Um, in many cases, you know, Bob Cajun, Benland Falls, Lindsay, uh, all the big downtowns were open. Uh, boating traffic was up. But on the po very positive side, with all of that activity, visitors, and locals, uh, we had no major infractions for COVID-19. So our, our law enforcement folks were really happy. And I think our business owners um, were 
breathing a sigh of relief to sort of have that first wave pass. And now more and more will start to open up. Uh, thank you, Dana, how about you? Um, yeah, similar similar here in Sogging Shores, um, we've kind of switched the messaging of uh, to, to cottagers unofficially, like not from the don't come, don't come to um, if you are coming, um, be prepared to like stay at the cottage more and, um, and uh, you know, be somewhat self-sufficient um, while you're here for a while. Like if you're here for longer, um, definitely check the downtown and and because it's it's that balance between you know we want people to shop local but then also do it in a safe way so um as a town we've really been boosting um public health messages about wearing masks um in retail businesses um, because we had been hearing from business owners saying you know people are just wandering in and um, we're trying to keep it safe for everyone. So the town and, and that's one thing that the mayor has uh, has really picked up on a lot is, is pushing that up because that's going to be one way of, of opening it up safely to cottagers as well as um, keeping it safe for permanent residents too. Um, so really, really focusing on public health messages. Um, as Sherry said, like our uh, economic to, uh, economic task force um, has met a couple times. Um, yesterday they met uh, and, and kind of went over the same things like all of those creative ideas and listening to the business community saying like what do you need from the town um, and then so uh, our strategic initiatives team so um, our economic development officer and uh, manager of strategic initiatives um, we're they're putting together um, the, the recovery plan and kind of what that looks like um, gathering all those ideas from business owners and and then presenting some of those ideas to council. Um, but yeah, so things like the, the sidewalk bylaw, um, they had passed that at council and just kind of broadening their space and restaurants that didn't have patios before now will have that. Um, and uh, yeah, some of those other ideas. Uh, we're doing a um, like a labor market study, um, partnering with the University of Guelph too, just to see kind of what the lay of the land is. It was going to be something um, that might have happened a bit earlier, but now it's actually a good thing because we can get a real a, a good picture of what labor the labor market looks like now that now that this has changed everything. Because you know, five months ago, if we had done it like this, would it would be out of date right now, basically. So. Yeah, all, right. so all those pieces, but definitely like shifting that messaging somewhat, you know, we're still saying be cautious, but but you don't have to stay home. Yeah. I mean, it does strike me that by now, uh, the messages that municipal government's been putting out should be understood in terms of uh, the public health messages. I mean, that's a well-worn groove at this point. And I would think that you're starting to see some kind of like the, the, the pressure to communicate is probably shifting more towards businesses now having to communicate to people coming through the door that these are the expectations in our workplace. So some of the, there's more people communicating those basic messages than just looking to uh, leaders to do that. Uh, the communities uh, gotta be sharing those messages amongst themselves. Okay. I'm wondering what's happening regionally in terms of economic development. Uh, Gary, Patrick, uh, one of you wanna weigh in there? Yeah, I, I can start and uh, Gary can follow, follow suit, of course. Uh, you know, I think this notion of um, it, it's twofold. It's we're you know we're still in the current pandemic um, and the reality of that, and the the messaging of of, of COVID and the messaging of staying uh, vigilant uh, with your safety and distancing and hand hygiene, and use of masks, uh, and distancing is impossible. Um, but you know you're you're still pushing that, but you're also pushing this this notion uh, of of reopening. And, and businesses reopening, you know, stage one for some, stage two for others, um, you know, so, you know, you end up pushing out a, a lot of uh, various messages. Sometimes it, you can actually lead to some confusion because, you know, can I go out? Is it safe? You know, but uh, businesses are reopening. We've done a lot of work with our economic development. I mentioned it on an earlier call. We have developed this toolkit. It is it is available. Download it at uh, york.ca slash COVID-19. And, and this, uh, it's a package available for businesses that are reopening, so it gives them that guidance. Uh, I think what we're seeing too, though, in the, in the Premier and the Minister, when the Minister, Minister Pod mentioned it yesterday at uh, the Premier's conference, is 
this uh, this notion of offering incentives and what that looks like uh, to help the businesses as they reopen and uh, you know removing some of the the red tape and the, the processes that are, are in place. So you know just creating this uh, this total climate uh, to help everybody out. So that will continue to be the, the partnership. Hi, Gary. Yeah, and, sure, and and I mean I echo a lot of Patrick's comments about the messaging is. Uh, you know, our chair just issued a statement once we found out that we're in the, the, the stage two. It's just about, about caution, right? And about, you know, everything is reopening, but we still got to maintain that physical distancing uh, mentality. And uh, we're ensuring that we, we are communicating as well, you know, um, instructions from our chief medical officers about, you know, how businesses should operate and, and give them some guidance. Um, and our economic task force has been, has been operating for the last couple of months really well. And we're continuing some of those um, online initiatives as well. Uh, the region just joined uh, the Shop Here initiative that uh, the City of Toronto uh, had started. So that, that's a great initiative for small businesses and artists, artists to get online and get, get an online presence. Um, we just recently launched a, um, uh, an online portal. And this is, this is in tandem with all of our BIAs who are working together. One of, the, one of the first initiatives that they've actually come together and, and worked together to get this out is a downtowns of Durham portal. So basically um, residents can still visit the downtown shop in the downtown um, and uh, you know, order, uh, order food and, and uh, visit restaurants virtually. And it's been a real great, big success. So we have 13 distinct downtowns within our region that we're, we're highlighting in this hub. So we're, we're still, Continuing with those online initiatives and then pushing, continue to push out our message of, you know, being safe, things are reopening. Um, we still have to be cautious. We still have to be um, aware of our physical distancing and ensuring that restaurants and as they open, as they reopen, are safe and, and doing this and following the guidelines of our chief medical officer. All right. Um, how about you, Tony? Uh, you're in the middle there. Uh, not small, not large, but. Uh, large enough, what's going on in Waterloo? Uh, well, not surprising, Brian. Um, we are actually doing something on a regional basis, um, and this started uh, late March. Um, so the uh, Chambers of Commerce in uh, Waterloo, Cambridge, Kitchener, as well as um, the Waterloo Economic Development Corporation, which is a, an entity that was formed about three, four years ago, and it handles economic development as a, at an arm's length for the region, so that not all, all the municipalities have the uh, ECDEV. We do have an ECDEV, but their focus is on um, essentially ensuring that there is uh, places for businesses to come to and that uh, the Waterloo ECDEV Corp, uh, they then try to attract businesses to come to the region. So uh, chaired by the uh, CEO of, of Waterloo Development ECDEV Corp, uh, they've been doing some work on advocacy with governments and they started doing that in March around some of the, the subsidies and the rent subsidies and some of those things that we've seen now that the, the feds have rolled out to now where they're uh, trying to assist uh, the businesses to uh, get going. Um, and so similar to what Gary had mentioned, uh, we have the same uh, Shop Here app. Um, we've got a retail map that we've uh, got on our website to, to help um, residents know who's open, uh, as well as a map for um, um, restaurants and what's available. So uh, we're trying to do that as much as possible on a regional basis, uh, because I mean, really the borders, uh, and, and Gary being a former Waterloo guy, knows what I'm talking about. Uh, they're really, the borders are, they're invisible, right? I mean, you go from Waterloo to Kitchener, you don't know unless you saw a sign that you changed. So uh, I think it's really important and it's expected of us that uh, we work on that kind of a coordinated basis. And quite, I've, I said it all the time, you guys do it well. I mean, that's the other thing. So um, what I will say is anybody uh, on the call that's uh, looking to uh, get samples, I'm sure they can follow up with uh, any of you uh, to expand on that. I, I would hope uh, the panel's all uh, good with that. And again, just before we move off this topic, if there's anyone who's uh, an attendee on the call that particularly has documents or plans that they uh, could share, uh, I know that after this call, I will get all kinds of requests from people to say, you know, can we get a document? Can we get a sample? You know, where I can find a plan that someone else has made. Uh, all that kind of information. So by all means, please share that if you've got it. That is the intent of these. Sent out uh, the invitation for this call. We got more. more out of office than we get. So that tells me that uh, there has been the, the communications people that I would think are taking a breather 
or municipal employers are telling staff that they have to take some time off, which I know has been a concern for many employers. Um, I'm wondering uh, how you're doing internally in terms of your communications team. And then after we kind of look at that, I want to look at what you're doing to kind of support the organization with internal communication for all of your staff as they either settle in or transition back to an office that's reopening, perhaps. So let's start with the teams. Uh, have you held on to everybody? How are they doing? And, uh, and, and have you had to make changes there? So Anyone want to start? I can start. I can start. Um, it's been interesting for me because, uh, I mean, I just started three months ago, basically, when this whole thing started. So it's, it's been uh, quite the challenge with my team, but I mean, I gotta say, uh, I, I have a great team and they've, they've adapted really well. Um, as far as uh, what you said about, about uh, vacation time, we just had a discussion about, you know, I, uh, we're encouraging, myself and the managers are encouraging our staff to take the time. And I know it is a challenge because, yeah, I mean, we all know we can't, we're, we're limited in where we can go, but I think it's important to, to take that break and take that uh, pause and re-energize and I've encouraged that for everybody and we've worked out a schedule and we'll, we'll just deal with it as, as we go um, but I've, I've been encouraging all my members of, of my team to, to take that vacation because it's just it's just a needed thing just to kind of get away from uh, the daily grind and, and uh, re-energize whether that be in your backyard or up north or wherever you go I know it's limited but it's still important to do that so uh, we've been able to you know schedule people in and out and have coverage um, because we do know we, you know, life still goes on. We're still dealing with this issue, uh, and I'm ensuring that there's coverage. But again, uh, just encouraging everybody to take vacation, just working with it. All right. Anyone else? Uh, what are you finding in terms of your teams, or what's novel, uh, Patrick? So I had mentioned earlier um, when uh, the pandemic was declared, we had uh, redeployed staff to to uh, assist uh, corporate communications here at the York Region and. Uh, we were operating three teams of 50 staff, uh, about uh, 14, 15 hour days, seven days a week. Uh, we've scaled that back a, a little bit, and uh, by the end of this week, we're going to return about two thirds of the staff back to their home positions. Um, we just think people need a bit of a break. And I think we can, we, we're pretty sure we can manage it based on the current model uh, through to through the Labor Day. And, and that does allow people to have a bit of a break and take some vacation and get, some, uh, get a bit of a break from this. Um, but it has been it has been a challenge uh, uh, at York Region on the vacation front. Uh, you know, a there was no place to go, and people were locked in for a period of time. And then, you know, I, I know from the, the comms folks that have been working, they didn't want to take vacation because they just were were uh, ingrained with the work, and they didn't want to leave uh, anybody sort of behind. And now we're into this uh, into this push of okay, so we've gone around the table and we're ensuring that people put in their vacation requests and then going to ensure that they take their vacation request because from a mental aspect of it, you know, everybody needs that break for sure. It's interesting times on that end. Anyone else on this? Or does that pretty much cover that or uh, anyone else have anything to add there? Right, we did ask people to uh, take at least five vacation days by the end of June and so uh, pretty much, and that, that goes through the entire organization and, and we were able to achieve that. Okay, um, I'm curious if, oh, Jerry, did you want to add something there? Uh, just quickly to add, um, similar in our situation where we're returning, our goal is to have uh, all staff returned at the end of June that were laid off. So we're seeing a lot of redeployment requests and uh, it's great that we've been able to scoop up some really talented people from other divisions that we wouldn't have thought of as communicators. But when we started to, and I would encourage maybe smaller municipalities, if you haven't already made that list of what are the skills that we need in this type of a crisis situation to sustain us, to maybe be our you know, third uh, wheel or to be that extra staff person? Have that list of skills and then have a short list of staff and maybe in you know, some of the downtimes or on special occasions or projects, whenever you can bring those people in to just start to get them up to speed, it would really save uh, the hours that um, I know I've spent in bringing up those redeployments to where we need them to be. And of course, we're gonna lose them in a couple of months, so it's, but it's not a loss. They're always gonna have that, that background they've learned in cons, should we need them again. So it's been good learning on our side. Have you had to do anything, uh, I'm, I'm curious if people have had to do anything uh, unique or uh, different in terms of onboarding employees 
uh, or getting just rehiring some of these employees? Is that all being handled by human resources or from a communication standpoint? Have you had to develop materials that uh, start to help uh, reintegrate or return these people back to work after a period of being away? Is that a role that uh, you as communicators have been taking on as well? I'm going to say that's probably a no. That's a bad factor. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess it's uh, maybe it's a little open ended because you know in some municipalities, uh, certainly at your region, we haven't really laid off very many people. Um, just from the, the nature of our work, um, I, I think the other conversation is just with staff. Uh, that internal component that Gary talked about is uh, you know giving staff the line of sight of when they can come back to work uh, from working from home, and, and that's still a big unknown. Uh, we've indicated to staff through the CAO that um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we, like three weeks ago, we said, you know, you will be working from home until at least Labor Day, and we'll reassess it uh, through the summer months. Um, we've also redeployed some uh, some of our public health staff uh, to to our, uh, our our main building. It's our largest building, uh, just to maintain the, the distancing. So they're actually in somebody else's seat. So uh, it's a bit of a staggered approach to. To get people back, but uh, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a, a shell game. You got to wait and see. And I do wonder about all these workplaces that went to virtual uh, offices and shared spaces and everything else. Uh, you know, I'm I'm thankful that our office is a Victorian model. You know, we're in an old house where everybody has their own room and a door. Uh, I think that's going to be a very compelling option for a lot of employers for a while. Um, those, uh, you know, some I know a lot of Bay Street offices switch to virtual uh, workspaces and everything else. We, you know, we always take the view that everybody deserves a door and a drawer. Uh, but if you don't have that, uh, I suspect there's a lot of shifts that are going on in some of your workplaces. Have you had has some of you had to deal with that and run into that uh, in terms of uh, you know making physical changes to workspaces for employees coming back? Yeah, I was going to jump in there. We. Um, uh, about, I would say like a third of office staff right now are back in Sogging Shores. Um, so, but but yeah, it's that mix between, you know, some of the, the outer offices have physical doors, um, whereas, you know, a lot of people are in kind of the pod or like the little cube, you know, cube pods and stuff. Um, so they have seen people shift, like, you know, uh, I think one of our clerks, uh, clerk, uh, assistance is like working from upstairs in the file room and you know so people are physically moving but but yeah it's been it's been a challenge I think um, once you see more people coming back you know like if, if I could have a sign on my door saying you know don't come in because I'm I'm nervous about you or whatever but you know if, if there are just four desks out in the open how do you actually get people to you know physically stop and, and you know talk from a distance <laughs> You need uh, Les Nesman as an, as an HR manager. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, in terms of internal communications for employees, I'm curious there in terms of how that's being handled. And I suspect for people on this call, there will be a range of everything from just straight email uh, to maybe apps that they use for that. I mean, I, like I know certainly the Bank of Montreal, when they try to communicate with their internal employees, they, they try to do it in a way that makes an employee feel it's the same as seamless as using a mobile device for any sort of communications they would have externally. That's going to be aggressive for a municipal government, but I'm curious what tools you're using to get information out to people. How regularly are you sending that information out? How much are you communicating with them? Um, anybody want to start there and give us a sense of, of how you're how you've been tackling that the last month? I can start there, Brian. Uh, we've really we really stepped up our internal communications, um, you know, up until a couple months ago, where we um, every day we send out a CAO email, and it's it's challenging, um, but I, it's it's been very effective. We just recently completed a staff survey early June, just to ask staff about one. Their, you know, their fears and apprehensions about coming back. Two, about how is teleworking working for you? And three, about the communications. And um, from the communications perspective, um, people really enjoyed and really look for that, that information right off in the morning from our, from our CAO. And uh, it's important information that we communicate. So people are getting used to, you know, looking at their, either their mobile devices or on their, on their laptops. Um, that, that message from our CEO, and I think it's important for from a leadership perspective to provide that information on a daily basis. Yes, it is 
sometimes a challenge to continually um, write those messages and get them approved and get them set up for the morning. But um, uh, we put a very big concerted effort on doing that. And it's nothing, it's not a new tactic or something uh, crazy out of the box, but it's, uh, I think it's a frequency that really helped us there. We also um, have been um, doing virtual town halls. Now the challenge there is, you know, we have a lot of off of, of workers that don't have laptops. Um, but how we got around that is uh, we may, we do it through teams, Microsoft teams, and we ensure we use the link that uh, you can use it from any computer or any mobile device. It does not have to be on the uh, municipal network, which is, is very key. So anyone can participate from any uh, device. And they've been very, very, very well attended. We've got a lot of questions. Um, you know, we, we schedule them for an hour, both of them. Uh, we've done one in April, one uh, we just completed. Um, they've gone over an hour because people just keep asking questions and so much engagement. And we are gonna probably continue those in the near future monthly. So we'll have another one in July, another one in August, another one in September um, for the foreseeable future because there's a lot of information about you know, returning to work. Um, those are our two main avenues that we've really been stepping up as far as internal communications. And then we also meet um, as a department head um, team every week. So myself as a communications rep, I make sure that I give an update at this, mess, at this meeting to you know, make sure that you know, our commissioners and our directors have that messaging to communicate it to their teams in their staff meetings. So I'm ensuring that, you know, th that they have a, a tool kit and they have the you know all the messages that we want to get out for that week as part of their um, toolkit that they can release to their in their management meetings as well um, so it's a lot of continual um, internal communications I think the key is just to kind of keep it going and keep it regular so people know where to go and where to turn to for information as I mentioned the, the email from the CAO they're used to now getting that every morning before usually before nine o'clock they're, they're uh, it's in their inbox and it's a message for the day and we're able to kind of, um, we, we sometimes edit that up until, you know, six, six at night, uh, adding information from the day's press conferences or the province announcements. So it's really been a, an incredibly effective tool that we've used uh, on a continual basis. Gary, how long is the, the, that email that goes out? Do you try to restrict it to a certain length or is there a, you know, to get consistency? Uh, you know, what does it look like? Yeah, we do try to restrict it. Obviously, we don't want, uh, you know, a four-page four scrolling email every morning. So it's usually, I would say on average, between four and five paragraphs. So it's a, it's a quick read. There's links in there. If people want to get more information on our intranet page, they can definitely do that. But you're right, Brian. We try to keep it condensed and simplified and, and to the point. All right. How about uh, others? What are, what are you using? What approaches are you using? internally to kind of keep people uh, uh, aligned and on the same page. Anyone want to start there? Brian, we've, we've been um, having leadership meetings. Uh, we were having them uh, every day, but uh, as the pandemic has continued, we scaled them back to twice a week now. And so, because um, uh, similar to what Gary mentioned, we thought it was important that the management team really be equipped to be able to answer questions and to share information. So uh, we have those now uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, we also then uh, provide a summary to all employees, and we've been doing, uh, similar to what uh, Gary described, a uh, virtual town hall meeting for staff. Um, we've done, we did one in April, May, and June, and we'll continue doing those as well. And uh, the engagement is, has been off the charts. Uh, we used to have those, um, you know, in person before the pandemic, and it was difficult to get people to ask questions. But pretty much now, we devote the whole thing to just a question and answer. The CEO will do a little overview of, of, of uh, sort of the state of affairs at that point and then we just take questions and uh, similarly we tend to run a little over time and then we share all of those questions and all of those answers out to everybody. So along those lines we had a question come in on the, the chat board there. Um, uh, Gary you mentioned town hall meetings and it wasn't clear to me whether I think you were talking about town hall meetings internally. Yes yes you're right sorry. So the question was uh, um, do you gather the questions in advance or do you take the questions live and what do you do about inappropriate questions? And of course, internally inappropriate questions would be career limiting, but uh, I am wondering, uh, so there is a bit of a check there. I know a number of uh, municipal governments have been using, uh, you know, Enveronics tools and things like that for very large uh, tele, uh, tele town hall meetings. We've discussed that in the past, expensive option, but people have been doing it. Where I'm in Mississauga, they do happen fairly regularly. 
Um, but internally, uh, do you just take, take the questions live on those staff town halls, Gary, or is there uh, uh, a, a prepared list that people go off? Of? So we have a mix of both. We ask uh, we ask people to submit questions uh, ahead of time, and we get we don't we actually don't get a lot of questions that way. We get maybe you know ten to twenty questions. Most of the questions come live, so we do take them live. I do have a staff member moderating through Teams, so the question will come in. Um, we'll deem if it's appropriate. And I'll tell you this right now, Brian, we have not had any inappropriate questions come through and we've had hundreds of questions come through. We take a lot of them. Um, and then, so once we moderate that, we push it to the live site so everybody can see. It's kind of like how the chat uh, function works on Zoom here. Everybody can see the question. Um, we have a facilitator that works in, in our office. Um, she's great. She does a great job at uh, selecting the questions. We actually communicate with her. So there's myself plus a staff member uh, in the room kind of moderating and watching it from the back end. And we communicate with our facilitator view, uh, via the WhatsApp, WhatsApp, WhatsApp app. Um, and you know, just kind of directing, helping her direct questions and maybe take this one next. And then we have our CAO and usually our, our commissioner of corporate services and our chief medical officer of health um, online answering them live on video. Um, and then we take all the questions and we post them on our insider. Every question we have an answer to and we provide video and transcript as well. And I'm, I'm actually incredibly impressed that there hasn't been any inappropriate questions. And but like you say, I mean, it is, you know, you can submit anonymous, but I mean, I'm sure you could track it down who sent it. But uh, hey, we haven't had any and I'm, I'm really happy with that. And we've had a lot of great questions, a lot of great interaction. Okay, Mrs. Saugus just weighed in to mention that they also have uh, a municipal world uh, piece that they've done on the communications uh, approaches that you're, they're using internally. Mrs. Saga always helpful in sharing information. Um, I will say also a shout out to Municipal World. They have been doing a ton of podcasts and a number of those are communications related. Um, and they just did a recent one with uh, Amos, new executive director in terms of where the sector is heading. Uh, he's the Amos, new executive director is uh, Kind of a quiet guy, not very, uh, uh, not a high profile on social media, but incredibly experienced, incredibly insightful, and incredibly articulate. So that uh, call is worth listening to if you want to get a sense of the big picture and where things are going. Uh, that's worth a listen. And again, there are a number that are communications related uh, that that Municipal World has put out. Um, I think they'll also take ideas. By the way, if any of you have uh, uh, topics that you want to pitch to Municipal World, uh, they will also help you find, track down experts and use that content. So we're thinking about. Um, anyone else on the internal communications front? Anything novel that we haven't covered that's worth sharing? Okay, I'm going to keep moving along to uh, talk of a second wave. So, uh, you know, there's this discussion of whether we're in a prolonged first wave or bracing ourselves for a second wave. When we look down the road in terms of future communications needs, I'm wondering if any of you have started to have discussions with your public health units or have started preparing communications materials uh, to help prepare for the possibility of a second wave? Or are you all just kind of like uh, recovering from the first wave? Uh, any thoughts there? <laughs> and is the second wave, is communication on the second wave different than communication on the first wave? Uh, any thoughts there? Maybe I can start, Brian. Um, you know, this notion of, uh, this notion of the, the first wave versus the second wave, it's, it's similar to the stage one, stage two. Uh, you know, what, what, what stage or what wave are we, are we in? Um, our medical officer of health, uh, Dr. Kurji, he advised a council uh, last week that um, the, the second wave, uh, what he's uh, read and he, what he's talked to and, and seen, it could come as early as September and, and be four times as worse as the initial wave. Uh, you know, obviously we're not hoping for that, uh, but that's a reality. So uh, we are looking at, uh, at at seeing what we can plan in in, in advance, and, and it's just uh, you know a little bit more of the same, um, but 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 then some. Uh, you know, being prepared for that for that second wave while you're still dealing with the, the current wave is uh, it's a it's a challenge, but it is a reality. Um, and you know, you're doing that against you know the businesses reopening now. You're doing that against the fatigue that people are. are Having their they're seeing their, their lives are disrupted. Um, their you know, the economic uh, base that we're seeing is uh, is uh, has sort of crumbled in front of us, but uh, slowly will come back uh, as it comes back on. Um, but this notion of communicating within the second wave 
if it is uh, anything like the first or then some, it's going to be a challenge because uh, we saw we saw that uh, in SARS actually with, with two bouts and, and dealing with the second bout of SARS was di- was more difficult than the first because people thought it was done, people thought it was over, and you're seeing that fatigue right now. So it, it's going to be a challenge for sure. And uh, and the notion of bringing in additional staff back to us to help support that uh, helps and help support public health. Um, you, you bring them on board, you you send them back home, and then you ask to bring them back again. Um, there's no guarantee you might get, get them all back. Uh, so there'll be a lot of challenges uh, ahead and down the road. Anyone else on that? Uh, preparing materials for a second wave or uh, refreshing what you've got or thinking ahead of dealing with that? Have you got uh, ammunition in reserve? Yeah, I would say um, the biggest thing really is just to, to curate and to, to document what you have done. Um, at the very beginning of this, um, our team uh, just started a Google Doc with like, basically you just kind of dump everything that you did that day into it. And um, at the start, it was just a way for all of us to communicate with each other and, and what the status of, of each project was. Um, but now I think we're looking at it as like, this is kind of the template for like what we can be doing um, if a second wave or a future outbreak happens. Um, and yeah, just reusing and, and documenting things that uh, that that you had put together. Um, we have a whole list of key messaging, and kind of as they've changed um, throughout the pandemic, um, you know, this was kind of like right off the bat, stage one key messaging, and then how that's kind of shifted. Um, I think all of those are, are going to be very important if if this happens again or when this happens again, for sure. All right. Uh, anyone else there? Sherry? I'll just uh, add on to Dana. Totally agree with that. You know, Robin duplicate all the things that have worked and, and I think the second wave in some ways will be easier in that we do have some tried and true and things that have been working. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that's been really successful for us on the media front is uh, about two weeks in, we started hosting um, every other day media scrums and invited all of our media. Um, we were getting attendance from um, all of our mainstream media. So all of our radio, TV, print, um, and online media were um, at the table with us every other day with our mayor and CAO to get the facts and to get the sound bites that we wanted to push out. And so that's one that we've actually kept up with on a weekly basis and will continue to do as long as there's a need. So I feel like that's a tool we've gained. We never used to use, but we can quickly resurrect that if we go into stage two and need to amp up. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. And uh, the other piece for us is that everybody's medical officer of health is different and has different strengths and ways of communicating with their uh, community. Um, and so for us, our our closest connection to our health unit and to the the words and the um, flavor of what we need to communicate has been through our emergency operations center meetings. So once or twice a week, getting that connection to the health unit to be able to say, yes, for the third day in a row, the numbers are good. Thank you, public, you're doing a good job, keep doing that. And then turn around and have our mayor uh, capture that message in his daily video was really helpful because we knew we were fully aligned with um, public health. Um, And I know in other areas, public health is very forward and they're out holding their own press conferences and sending that message. But for other areas that like ours that don't have that, that's been really helpful for us. So I would say, uh, especially in phase phase two, when it comes, we're gonna need, or stage two or second wave, we're gonna need to continue to lean on, on those people to be helping us shape the message. Okay, we got a question coming in. Uh, Someone asked me if key messages can be shared. I just asked for a clarification on, on respect to what topic is specifically, or is it just all key messages um, and really who it's directed to. But I would say that uh, I have found uh, uh, that uh, municipal uh, communicators have been very, very helpful at sharing messaging on various topics. Uh, so don't be afraid to ask if you think that somebody's got uh, the right approach or you're curious how uh, a similar part of the province uh, uh, might be handling their messaging. Uh, my strong advice is to ask, people are sharing a lot of stuff. 
Um, with respect to the, um, the second wave and a media launch, one thing that we've been working on, which may be of interest, and I can't go into too much detail on it here for you, um, but the AMO conference is moving to a completely virtual AMO conference. So we are trying to figure out how that's going to work. And one of the things we're trying to figure out is uh, media scrums with all the party leaders. So we've been uh, speaking to cabinet office, the premier's office, and their suppliers to figure out how the daily briefings are being done by the premier every day. A lot of good insights there in terms of how to approach something on that scale and do it virtually. That's going to be overkill for most people, for sure. Um, but if anybody has uh, has questions about how that works and how if you really had to do a large second wave kind of news conference or you had a major outbreak and want to figure out how to make that work, um, that's well-worn ground out of the Premier's office now. And there's a lot of turnkey solutions and options that you can use. Um, and we have that, that uh, if, if you're ever uh, in need of, of tracking that down. Um, with respect to the AMO conference, you're gonna be hearing more about it for sure, but uh, that is uh, a bit of a teaser to let you know that it is going ahead, um, that it is uh, largely business as usual, but uh, because it is such an unusual time, um, you know, the, the old adage of don't let a good crisis go to waste, uh, we've been able to use this to create some new opportunities. So one of the things that we're looking at um, is very far along is discussions with TV Ontario uh, to have TV Ontario as a strategic partner with the AMO conference and to help share a lot of that content and develop a program with us and everything else. So there's some very exciting things happening around that. There's also like, I have to tell you, like a million discussions about, okay, like every day it's how do we make this work? How do we make that work? And, and can it be done? Um, so it's all very interesting. And I'd love to tell you like, here's how it's going to work. We don't know all that yet. Um, our next communications group call will probably be in about a month to give folks a heads up of, of more details on what to expect in that conference and, and how it's coming together and how it'll work. All right, um, I did want to uh, also touch on just social media outrage. Um, there's been a lot of it lately and it's related to you know other topics and social movements, but I think it's also related to the fact that people are cooped up, They're, uh, they haven't shaved, uh, they uh, have not really seen people much, and I, I find it spilling out uh, into social media circles, particularly the material coming out, coming out of the United States, it's very, very angry all over the place. I'm wondering if any of you have had concerns that your local neighborhood is getting angrier than normal, um, or if you felt that there's a need to kind of uh, provide some leadership and just kind of keeping people positive and respectful and patient as they kind of weather the pandemic. So sort of like, uh, community leadership to keep people smiling. I'll also say the other, the other thing we're seeing is counselors that are getting distracted and are starting to going down rabbit holes that are probably not helpful. <laughs> well, they're not helpful. So I'm wondering uh, if any of you have put out any kind of communications materials that are designed to just keep the neighborhood positive, cheerful, and patient and good to one another. So I, I can start maybe, Brian. We've, um, throughout this entire um, pandemic, we've been using the hashtag Durham Strong, and we've been encouraging people to to share their their positive stories, and it's it's been really good. I mean, we haven't had a lot of uh, negative backlash. Um, uh, some of the things that you mentioned, I don't know. Maybe people are happier in Durham. I don't know, but um, we we have been encouraging people to share their stories. So through this um, Durham Strong hashtag, we've got a lot. We've got chalk drawings. We have, uh, you know, kids drawing pictures. We we launched a coloring contest where people can download um, pictures uh, associated with various services that we deliver in the region, and we've had those submitted, and people are posting them in their windows. So it's it's been incredibly um, positive in, in Durham, which I'm ha very happy to see, and people are really sharing a lot of uh, incredible stories that uh, uh, perseverance and uh, you know through for you know, the challenge that we've had in a long-term care center, some stories of, uh, you know, some stories that will make hit that made, that made me tear up and, and just, you know, hearing these, these incredible um, battles with, with this, um, with COVID and, and how they've come through it and, and how they've, be, how they've become stronger as a, as a community, as a, as a whole. So we've really seen a lot of great positive um, um, messages shared across our social media, nothing incredibly negative from our point of view. All right. Anyone else there? Anything you're doing to keep people cheerful? Patrick? Uh, Brian, I think there's just this uh, thirst for information and uh, people have this desire to, to have as much education on COVID as, as they possibly can. And uh, 
Uh, so we just sort of provide the environment for that. And, uh, and, and we're just pushing out a ton of content every single day. And, you know, like Brian and, or like uh, Gary, I should say, and others, uh, you know, we created this uh, Spirit of YR campaign and, you know, done in the early days, but you know, the municipalities, our residents have really picked up on that. And uh, it's really like their own campaign. We have a, we push out our numbers on uh, update our dashboard every day at five o'clock. And we push that out on social. And uh, recently we've had an individual and, and he takes the numbers and he breaks it down even further. Uh, and, you know, gives uh, people a, a bit more of insight into, you know, four cases in Vaughan, two in the market, one in Cora. And he has a bit of a mini following uh, and uh, people are waiting for him to, to take this and, uh, and uh, dive into it a little deeper. Uh, so we acknowledged him on social uh, few days ago we acknowledged him as part of our our spirit of yr campaign and uh, you know he was thrilled and uh, his followers were happy and uh you know he's out there performing a bit of a service so uh there's just a lot of that going on and uh, um that's the nice part to see throughout all of this so we kind of hope it, it continues throughout all right um in terms of things continuing i'm questioning i just I'm, i want to really spoke speak i think to the larger urban folks that have transit system in terms of concerns about a funding crunch um difficult topic i don't want to alarm your own people but uh, if we follow the social media feeds of the large uh, municipalities with transit systems um uh, they are saying you know we're, we're worried about running out of cash so i'm wondering if that is uh an internal topic of communication or whether that's an issue that you have to manage internally on the one hand, I'm sure you want to tell employees that you know we've got stability, and here's where you go with questions. But if they follow those Twitter feeds, uh, you know a lot of those statements are alarming, um, and you know it begs the question of whether you're starting to prepare for the possibility that there could could be a second round of very tough decisions to make uh, uh, externally and internally, or related to services. So how are you faring on the uh, on the balance sheet? I think in, in terms of how it affects communication. Transit, uh, Brian, has always been really a lost leader, uh, especially at the regional level. Uh, it's a necessary service uh, for sure. Uh, York Region, like Durham, like others, a large geographical area uh, covering uh, you know, a lot of buses to cover the, these areas. Um, and uh, you know, making money on transit is not, not really viable. In transit with COVID, uh, much like everywhere else where people started to stay at home and uh, and uh, we're in isolation, uh, the transit numbers plummeted. Uh, so yeah, we've, we, we continue to lose money uh, weekly uh, as it relates to transit. Uh, you know, we still operate at uh, um, transit to a certain degree. Our, our, our numbers are you know, maybe at 30% uh, capacity. It's starting to come back uh, a little bit as more businesses start to reopen. Um, you know, necessary to keep transit going, especially in the earlier days, because uh, you know, a lot of frontline workers uh, uh, the cleaning companies and, and, and the like, uh, working uh, nights and overnights, uh, needed to needed the ability to get to where they, they need to go. But you know, we're also seeing now, and TTC talked about it last week, uh, operating transit in this new normal, uh, not really having the ability to maintain physical distancing. You can't operate transit at 30 percent capacity, and uh, and think it's going to be viable. So, um, you know, the need for for folks to wear masks and and uh, try to maintain the distancing as best you can. Um, but uh, that is a challenge and uh, that is something that uh, the mayors and chairs are, are continuing to have those discussions at the provincial and federal level to, to seek funding uh, for that, that issue alone. That, that's, a, that's a big issue for municipalities for sure. All right, anyone else there in terms of uh, what, in, in, I mean, anything to add to that, Gary or, or, or Tony, you're probably the ones that are, I think, most facing this challenge. I mean, a lot of similar com comments to what Patrick was, was getting at. I mean, we're definitely having those conversations at the leadership table about, um, you know, financial shortfalls and, and uh, you know, trying to look for savings as much as we can internally. Um, we are hoping that the provincial and federal governments kick in um, some money to help us through this. Um, but we're definitely planning for, you know, if, if they're not and, uh, and, and going forward, I mean, um, it's, it's, there's going to be some tough dis discussions, I'm sure, uh, going forward, but, um, you know, it's all about planning for it and, and, uh, trying to find those efficiencies internally, um, that, that will help us, you know, kind of ease the burden here. 
know, I'm often cheering on Mississauga, but I'll do it again here. Um, you know, the Bonnie Crombie's office has been very, very fast to respond to developments with, uh, with good information, like, you know, good, clear statements that they're putting out. Mississauga is in a top, tough spot. It's one of the uh, areas where there is hot spots. They're not moving to stage two. Uh, and I can tell you that the neighborhood's uh, restless as can be uh, to open up. Uh, and uh, they're really sounding the alarm on what the fiscal crunch could be and setting up the public for all of these issues. They're dealing with them very, very openly uh, through communication from the mayor. So if anybody's looking for ex an, uh, uh, examples of you know, walking that difficult path. Mississauga is doing it in a very public way and in a very, very fast manner. Like they are very, very responsive to get information out. So a uh, good place to look if you're looking for ideas on, on where you might go or how you might handle it with a council or an official uh, staff message. All right, uh, we uh, had another question come in around Canada Day. So uh, what are you doing to prepare for Canada Day? Um, and I hope it's not a giant barbecue, but uh, what, what are your thoughts on Canada Day and getting ready for Canada Day? Anyone want to start there? Who's worried about Canada Day? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or is this going to be like, we're, we're used to it now, so we know what to expect. Dana, do you uh, yeah. want to say something? Yeah, I think um, in Sogging Shores, um, our Chamber of Commerce is leading Canada Day this year. Um, it's transitioning after that, but uh, but yeah, definitely like, you know, typically there'd be a fireworks display and, and the big celebrations, that sort of thing. Um, what they've decided to do is, is to move the fireworks to Labor Day, hopefully, um, if, if that's, you know, more of a possibility. Of getting people together then um, but I know that the chamber is definitely exploring some some other ways of you know how to engage people virtually or, or you know from home with some of those contests and things like that because uh, you know even with this stage two that we're in I mean that's still a maximum of 10 people at gatherings so that that won't look the same for sure so yeah but it's it's coming up fast so. <laughs> It's uh, definitely on, on their mind for sure. Press Brian, this was going to be the first year that the city of Waterloo was going to host Canada Day. It had previously, oh, probably for the last 30 or so years, been uh, hosted by the University of Waterloo, uh, but a transition to the city. So this was our, our first foray into it. And uh, of course, now it's not going to go forward. So we are going to have, uh, as, as Dana described, well, more of a uh, virtual type. Um, and so we are involved in local uh, musicians, and they're going to be. Uh, uh, online and they're going to be performing some of their own original music as well as O Canada. So, um, you know, we had some good plans on how we wanted to launch this as a city of Waterloo thing, but uh, it's going to transition to a virtual this year and um, probably, you know, post some images of, of some fireworks. But uh, little, it is a bit disappointing because we were looking forward to doing it for the first time, but, uh, um, you know, this is where we're at. All right, my apologies, folks. My uh, Wi Fi died, so uh, I got booted and I'm back on there, back at it. So, uh, I went from plan A to plan B to plan C today, but we're still rolling. Um, anyone else on fireworks? Uh, uh, there was a question that came in, is anyone doing fireworks uh, this year? So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give a, our, our um, we're not doing fireworks, by the way. We're doing a, a virtual, um, it's called Canada Day the Durham Way. So we're doing a virtual <laughs> online experience um, from two to 5 p.m. And, and we're gonna be hosting it through our local Rogers station as well as through our um, Durham Tourism Facebook Live page. So much like uh, Tony was mentioning, we're gonna have some uh, local performers. We're gonna have uh, the Super Dogs there. They're gonna do an animal trick show. We're gonna have uh, uh, speakers. Um, it's, it's gonna be interesting to see how it unfolds, um, but uh, you know, uh, in, in a virtual atmosphere. Um, I don't think we're doing any virtual fireworks, but um, it should be interesting, and uh, and um, we're we're hoping for the best, and uh, we're uh, we're excited to to kind of host the Canada Day virtually and, and get everybody uh, jazzed about you know being Canadian and, and celebrating uh, virtually in, in a COVID world. It's uh, it's definitely going to be interesting for everybody across across Canada um, experiencing Canada Day this time. Yeah, and I question how I mean. There's no question that we're going to be dealing with large crowds. Uh, I, uh, I did a bit of a road trip with my uh, son where we tried not to get out of the car, but uh, uh, approaching uh, Barry, Innisfil area, uh, uh, to my horror, my child des 
desperate, desperately had to pee. <laughs> so we ended up we ended up at the en route in Innisfil, and it was uh, la that was last Sunday. I caught a traffic coming back, and it was pretty much a gong show at the en route. And I just can't imagine what that's going to look like on Canada Day. I think it's just going to be packed. Um, there were some people wearing masks, but not a lot. So to your point, Patrick, about another wave and, and it being deeper, uh, I, I, you know, I, I suspect that a lot of medical officers of health are nervous, particularly the GTA. So uh, anyway, um, uh, any other thoughts there on Canada Day in terms of plans or messages you're getting out? I, I think if anybody has already started to prepare infographics or is an early adopter, get some infographics uh, available on that, and you'd be willing to share them, that I'm sure would be helpful to a lot of the people on the call with things related to Canada Day. Um, just a reminder that AMO's COVID-19 page has a lot of resources on it, tons of them. It's, a, it's now it's a giant deep library, um, but that does include infographics. So if somebody's got infographics related to Canada Day or is preparing them and can share them with us, we will make them available to everybody through that COVID-19 page, which I know will be a lifesaver uh, for some of the people on the call here. Uh, what we're looking for in that respect, by the way, of course, is that you, you need your permission to use it with your town logo scrub. Uh, you know, if it's got a big York region on it, it's not going to get used in Kenora. Um, but if you've done the work and you want to throw a ball to somebody like Kenora, that can then, then take that and run with it, uh, it's very, very helpful. Not everybody has uh, teams of 50 people there, Patrick. <laughs> so to think of those people. All right, um, anything to add? I think we're in the home stretch here, about four minutes left. I'm just going to last check and see if we've got questions coming in. Uh, and if there's anything that anybody wanted to add, now's the time to do it. Um, oh, and I, I also got a reminder going out uh, from AMO to, to mention that all past calls are recorded. This call will be report, recorded as well, and they will be on the COVID-19 uh, section. If there's questions that people have, uh, related to information, you can still push that through the COVID-19 email address. We'll try to be uh, helpful there. The, um, this is the last planned communications call that we've had. And I think what I'm going to do is we'll, we'll see if we do get a second wave. Uh, we'll see if there is a moment. And it may be well into the, uh, you know, maybe looking at a September call or something like that dealing with issues like people going back to school or taking stock and seeing what it looks like. But I think that's probably the right time to do another call like this. Um, but again, I welcome thoughts to, from those participants that have been involved in these calls from the start. Uh, there's still on average about 100 people or so. I think Brian is frozen. Yes, everybody else seems alive. Yeah. <laughs> it's come the back, Brian, come back. <laughs> well, thanks everybody. It's always good to see you and exchange stories and tips. Mm -hmm. Thanks a million. Yes, thanks everybody and stay well. Hope uh, everyone's Canada Day goes uh, wonderfully. Absolutely. Yes. Stay healthy. Happy Canada Day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, is he coming back? Maybe. No. <laughs> call on. <laughs> Bye, Brian. Well, that looks that looks like a wrap. Uh, but we again, our panelists have uh, signed off here. Um, Brian, he may have had some technical issue. Um, I'm sure everyone across the board has had that at some point. But uh, not Maybe seeing him rejoin us. Ah, there, there we go. So I think I'm back just in time to sign off and do a thank you. Um, <laughs> We better do it before uh, you know I have more glitches over here. Today's been uh, one after another. So um, I want to thank everybody on the panel while I still have a chance. So thank you for doing that. I want to thank all the participants. Um, and again, we will be sending out information related to the AMO conference. So if you're if you're a communications manager, if you're the top communications manager for your municipality, and you are not on AMO's regular communications list, we want to get you on that list. We'd like to have at least one communications manager from each municipality on AMO's list. And again, uh, we provide updates in terms of red brick through our own uh, mailing list as well. So if you're interested in that, pile on uh, the red brick list. If you're the communications lead for your municipality, we do want to make sure that we have a patch into you. Otherwise, we rely on your mayor or your clerk to get information to you, which you may not want to do. <laughs> so uh, get that direct connection. 
uh, we'd like to keep you in the loop. Uh, any final thoughts from the panel uh, before we run? All right, seeing none, I'm going to thank everybody once again. And uh, don't touch anybody's face. Wash your hands and good luck on Canada. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.